Welcome to the Aspen Institute's McCloskey Speaker Series event featuring Rachel Bittekoffer and Tamara Keith in conversation with Dan Glickman. I'm Crystal Logan, Vice President of Community Programs and Engagement here at the Aspen Institute, and I want to first thank Bonnie and Tom McCloskey for making this series possible. Thanks to our audience for tuning in for this important conversation. As I introduce our guests today, you'll find links to their bios in the chat, as well as other important information throughout the event. If you have questions for our speakers today, please type those into the Q&A feature on your screen uh, anytime during the event. Rachel Bittekoffer is a political scientist and senior fellow of elections at the Niskanen Center. Uh, her book, The Unprecedented 2016 Presidential Election, is available online. Uh, Tamara Keith is a White House correspondent for NPR and co-hosts the NPR Politics Podcast, the top political news podcast in America. She is part of the Politics Monday team on the PBS NewsHour, a weekly segment rounding up the latest political news. Secretary Dan Glickman is our moderator today. He is vice president of the Aspen Institute and executive director of the Institute's congressional program. He served in the US Congress from Kansas for 18 years, was President Clinton's uh, Secretary of Agriculture, and was also president of the Motion Picture Association of America, where he succeeded longtime MPAA head and late Aspen Institute trustee, Jack Valenti. We are thrilled and honored to feature you all here today. Uh, and with that, over to you, Dan. Thank you. Thanks, Crystal. And I'm indeed honored and humbled to be with uh, two of the leading election pro prognosticators, although I'm not going to ask you who's going to win, who's going to lose. That, that we'll do later on in the year if we have another chance. But I am going to talk to you about your, your extreme backgrounds. I think, Rachel, you've been uh, referred to as an election nerd. Maybe you referred to yourself that way. I think, Tamara, you're probably an election nerd too. And as somebody who's run for office 10 times in my life, I'm certainly an election nerd <laughs> as well. But it was the uh, British politician who's story, historian who's who said, may we live in interesting times. And he theoretically based that on an old Chinese curse. And, uh, and uh, we are in the most extraordinary times I have ever seen in my life. I'm older than both of you, but I started my politics in 1973 and I've never seen anything like this before. And I, I, I'm gonna ask you both more of what I call a 30,000 foot question. And that is, we've got this horrendous pandemic COVID. And we don't know where it's going. We don't know if it's going to get better or not get better. It's led to these incredible economic uh, scenarios and conditions that people are facing, mostly working and poor people, but everybody in this country and, and around the world. We have all these issues involving systemic racism that have been raised as a result of the George Floyd situation. And we seem to have this growing lack of trust in government, which has probably always been an undercurrent in America but it's much more serious now than it's been before. So given all these things, these what I call asteroids that are hitting the political side of the world, how does this change presidential politics uh, from what we have experienced before? And I think I'm gonna start with Tamara because she was on first and then I'm gonna go with Rachel afterwards. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I think that, um... It is bigger than a lack of faith in government. I think that there is a degradation of faith in institutions more broadly in this country. And obviously that is not a new development. It's something that's been growing. Um, and it, you know, it, it gets to the church. It gets to uh, the press clearly. Um, and government as well. And, and when you combine a lack of faith in institutions with a really scary pandemic, uh, when people just want facts, you end up with something really challenging. And, and obviously the president, the current president, President Trump, um, sort of relishes in uh, trashing institutions um, in a way that presidents don't typically do. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, presidents don't typically uh, sort of 
go out, you know, spread conspiracy theories about their own government while they're while they're leading it. Um, so it creates this really unusual dynamic um, that, uh, you know, I. I'm not sure exactly what it means for the election, uh, but I will say that um, there, there is something that is showing up in polling and elsewhere, which is that people are simply exhausted. People are exhausted by the pandemic. They are exhausted, uh, especially people of color, by the systemic racism. And people are sort of exhausted by um, the, the daily drama that comes from the White House. Um, including Trump supporters are exhausted by the daily drama that, you know, that gets picked up in the, uh, I wish he would tweet less, which is something that we've been hearing for a long time. But, you know, there's, there is a difference between um, a candidate for president and someone who has been president for three and a half years. Rachel, you want to comment on this? Yeah, you know, I'm increasingly interested in, in the 30,000 foot view. I mean, as a political scientist in my training before I, I became an election nerd, um, you know, female election forecaster making predictions and horse racing stuff. I mean, uh, kind of that's that stuff is kind of like a byproduct from the work that I do, which is deeply theoretical and really grounded in voter behavior, voter psychology, and particularly in the area of political polarization. And so when we think about like the decline in trust of institutions and government, the decline in trust in, of the press, those are things that it didn't just like they didn't just evolve naturally. They were products of like political choices that were made by you know political actors, right? So we have the you know emergence of uh, reemergence really of partisan news, um, you know, coming in the talk radio and then cable news and then the internet, and we have um, campaign like our, our American campaign system is very unique. I don't think most Americans realize that most countries don't have a wild west, you know, two year long campaign <laughs> process where you can kind of just say whatever you want or do whatever you want to. And those things have really eroded public confidence. So it's not like the public just kind of naturally came to this, this um, really um, cynical place, right? They, it, it's a product of, of 30 or 40 years of really heavy, um, you know, advertising and media focus on Kind of spoiling the idea of self, of of trust in institutions, and you know I, I'm increasingly looking too at the 244 years that the republic's been in function as a as a very short time window. We've had one near miss of the collapse at, in the Civil War, and as uh, somebody who studies political polarization, we are seeing behaviorally you know, a lot of overlap. Um, you know, when I, I'm, I'm going up to DC right after this interview for um, an interview and the um, election that I'm comparing 2020 to is not 2016, it's, it's, 20, it's 1860. So, you know, I should tell you a little bit about what's going on here in 2020. So do you, either one of you think we're at a uh, point, a trajectory for a near miss uh, and, and could that asteroid hit the Earth, the one that I was talking about in, in the year 2020 uh, in this election? I mean, is it that potentially bad? If, she'll, if you'll humor me and just let me let me respond quick, you know, first and quickly, I, you know, I do keep talking about where we are as an abnormality. And, you know, I think we did jump into a habit of talking about each presidential election is this is the most important election ever and the fate of the world hangs on the election so that, you know, it's kind of like the boy who cried wolf. But in, in this case, in this context, if we think of just about where we're at with this pandemic. It is true that we do have this very calamitous pandemic situation in the US and it's having these massive economic repercussions and people are going to be looking at very tough decisions as to, to send their children to school in the fall. But when we look at that in the global context, like it didn't have to be this way, like the other, um, you know, democracies, especially established democracies of the world, they didn't just, you know, bend their curve, they crushed it. And now they're you know, recovering from a, you know, a pandemic that is well managed. Ours is raging out of control. So that is just one symptom of a country, like this is not the America that you and I and, and Tamara know and love, right? We are the country that stamped out fascism and put a man on the moon. And, you know, we can't, 
we can't even handle this pandemic in the way that our global friends and allies are handling it. So I think it really does indicate that we're in a, in a position and a time period where we have we have we are at a at a, a juncture and this election period is really um, a, a time of American um, you know strife. And Tamara, how would you comment on that? Well, I think certainly our divisions are being laid bare by the pandemic. Um, and the fact that something like wearing a mask has yeah. become a political symbol um, is, is a, you know, a very big uh, flashing red light about just how divided uh, we are as a country. Um, that, that science is partisan Right. is pretty mind boggling and, and is a reflection of this time. And, and what, what I don't know is, you know, is this an echo of the great recession? You know, is, is some of this division a result of this huge shock that our society experienced? Um, that, you know, the, the, is populism, the support of po for populism, uh, you know, an outgrowth of that shock that we experienced a decade ago. And, um, and what in the world is going to happen 10 years after this shock, because this one is even more significant. And I, you know, smarter people are probably thinking about this, but, uh, you know, um, there are people who are still um, experiencing trauma from 2008 and 2009. Um, and, and now even more people are going through it now. And, you know the the combination of uh, sort of the the death toll, the families suffering with loved ones in ICUs that they can't see or touch or be near, um, the job losses, the 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 stress that families are under is really hard to underestimate, and and that has to affect the way people think about this election, how they think about voting, and it's probably going to affect the way people think for a generation to come at least. So both of you are well experienced in drilling down into the public and the constituencies and how the parties work. Uh, just as a note, when I ran for Congress in Kansas, and Kansas is not known as a big bastion of democratic politics, but I was a Democrat from a Republican district and we had other Democrats in there. And I recall that uh, when President Reagan ran and I was, he carried the state by 65% of the vote and I carried my district by 65% of the vote. Um, and that was not necessarily unusual. And that had to do with, I don't know if it had to do with as Rachel, you talked about the elasticity of the base or whatever, but there wasn't much of a base to be honest with you. I got a lot of Reagan voters that liked me and voted for me. And most members of Congress were able to kind of manage that. So talk a little bit about this now, the base. Yeah, yeah, very, crazy. very happy to talk about that. In fact, like uh, the electorate that that served with you when you served in Congress had distinct elements that no longer, you know, are do, that are no longer applicable. When we look at American political behavior, the time period that you served in Congress was a time period. I mean, it's it's it's, it's always in flux. So I don't want to say like it was in flux and now it's not in flux. It's just that the time period that it was in flux then was um, you know a really really fluid period where the Southern realignment was um, in in massive movement, and so you had ideological liberals um, who were Republicans at that time period. So if I knew you were a Republican in 1980, it, it probably meant that you supported lo, uh, low taxes and you weren't in support of, of abortion, but it didn't definitely mean that. You could have been a Rockefeller Republican and you could have supported abortion access. Um, the way it does now, of course, is that it, it really does give me a very tight uh, guide to your issue positions. And in the um, past too, of course, we had conservative Democrats. Now there are still more holdover conservative Democrats and the, and the Democratic Party ideologically is more heterogeneous than the Republican Party is. But in that time period, yes, it was very easy to pull over a crossover voter who was, um, you know, a Republican identifier or a Democratic identifier in party 
but who identified with you ideologically. And it's just different now because the, it's, it's a, a term from political science literature called party sorting. If you Google that, you'll, co you'll come up with a couple of great political science books and studies that talk about that um, ideological sorting process that was had really profound impact. So it's not that party hasn't always been important in American politics, but it's so important now that I don't need to know anything about you except for your party. And I can guess nine out of 10 times who you're going to vote for, not just for president, but all the way down the ballot, as long as you've got that little D or little R next to it. And, you know, in the last 10 years, I mean, really the last five or six years, it's become so powerful that that D and R, you'll still go with it, even if the candidate has major personal flaws, like um, Roy Moore down in Alabama did. Yeah, I mean, there's just, yeah, there's just not ballot splitting in the way there used to be. Um, and, and so that means that you're more likely to get waves or to get, um, you, you know, uh, the, the, you, you, there are not a lot of Republicans who can be rewarded for moderation right now. Um, you know, in, in 2018, there were a few candidates who tried to separate themselves from President Trump um, on, on the theory that, like, their voters understood them. They knew uh, that, you know, they, that they were, um, you know, they, they, they were moderate, that they, you know, stood up to the president when he needed standing up to, things like that. Um, and they simply, you know, Democrats were not going to reward somebody with an R next to their name just because they took some moderate positions or stood up to the president. And in fact, a lot of Republican voters were like, oh, that person's a squish. Um, he, isn't, he or she isn't loyal enough to President Trump. And so uh, what you have seen, and this is, you know, this is um, sort of a, a part of that sorting and that uh, partisan identity where, you um, the party matters more than anything. Like, you know, you, there, there are polls somewhere that where you ask people like, would you allow your child to date someone from right. another party? And people would say like, no way, that's worse than, than, you know, a lot of other things. <laughs> so does this make it easier to prognosticate elections or does it make it more difficult? Uh, I mean, that's, that's the business. That's a Rachel question. Yeah. It's, made me, it's made me nerd famous, you know? I mean, yeah, so I argue it does because, you know, like, I mean, really like, I mean, I wouldn't call it the meat of my theory. There's many things that are the meat of my theory. This is more like a, a limb of it, but yeah, it does. I mean, so basically in 2018, just being a Republican and, and, and you know, keeping in mind, it's it, a district or a state shapes the ideology of the member because you're going to have in a swing district, you're going to have moderate members who run and get supported by the parties in the primaries and win those primaries and become like moderate. So it's not like, um, you know, it, people think of it kind of the, uh, the opposite way, like, Oh, we, you know, the, the moderate person makes, you know, it makes it, it is made by, um, you know, they're making it moderate, but really it's the, it's the conditions of the election, right? You can't be an ideologue and represent a, um, swing area very effectively because you have to get independence at least to vote for you. So when we think about like all the Republicans that got wiped out in 2018, it was going to be all the ones that were in competitive places. And as, as Tamara just pointed out, you know, it didn't matter even if they had um, kind of more moderate voting records, their affiliation by party label with Trump was, a, you know, a, a electoral death sentence for them. And I understood that, you know, um, having watched what happened to Democrats with Obama, you know, and the Democratic affiliation in the 2010 and to a lesser extent 2014, more in the Senate in that wave. Um, you know, so, you know, that that's a big difference. I mean, it, it's always been that there's a midterm effect and the president's party loses seats in the subsequent midterm. But the size of the midterm effect um, that we've been seeing and just these sharp, sharp swings have really been pronounced. I mean, it looks like the electorate's basically Jekyll and Hyde, right? Like, oh, I want Democrats in charge. No, now I want Republicans in charge, right? But it really is a product of this polarization this nationalized election. So um, and as Tamara is pointing out, it's very difficult for a member to say, um, you know, hey, I'm really focused on the issues that are specific to Kansas second 
um, you know, because they get pulled into the national conversation. So all of these Senate um, and Republican incumbents that are going to lose in the fall are going to be trying very hard to talk about what they do specifically for Colorado, for Maine, for Arizona, for North Carolina. But the conversation is going to be about Donald Trump and their relationship with Donald Trump. And that is ultimately what's going to do them in. And Tamara, do you think, uh, going again back to this issue of prognosticating elections, where you have to go on and say, well, I think this is the way things are going to go, and this is the way things are going to go. But given this kind of um, polarization that we're in, is it possible to prognosticate elections? Uh, um, I mean, I, I know polling does its best to do this on a scientific basis, but, but uh, are there so, enough people who can move based upon their economic circumstances to change their position? Well, and it's not just about swing voters and Rachel is, is better at speaking to this than I am, but it's also about who turns out and right. who is motivated to vote. Um, and, and, you know, polls are a snapshot of a moment in time. And if the election were held today, uh, President Trump would have a major problem. Um, <laughs> something could change, you know, like uh, this is 2020. I'm not going to, uh, predict that things are just going to be stable and normal for the next three months or four months, four months. Um, who the heck knows? I mean, like an asteroid could actually hit, I mean, it, it, and it wouldn't be the weirdest thing that happened this year. Yeah, um, let's, hope, let's hope it's the other side of the earth and it's small enough so it doesn't impact. Yeah, just a few little ripples. Um, yeah, so I mean, I guess what I'm saying here is like, um, I I have a different job than Rachel does. Rachel has, has gotten into the forecasting business and she's, and, and she's got the confidence to roll with it. And I uh, am able to sort of analyze what I see and tell you what the campaigns are doing and tell you, um, you know, how that compares to the past. Um, but um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't run models. I don't, I don't make predictions. Uh, I, I try, um, I try not to because uh, I hate looking at video of me when I've said <laughs> something that's wrong. <laughs> well, we I, will, I, I will say though, you know, Donald Trump has made things a lot easier on election forecasters because, um, you know, the, the number one rule that I used to tell my students about elections when, you know, I teach students how to run and do elections, uh, campaign work was to never overestimate the intelligence of voters in terms of like your marketing and digital and advertising messaging and stuff like that, which is, you know, a little bit cynical, but it's a, it's a hard truth that people need to learn. But I've had to recently replace that number one rule with something I, I think is fairly obvious, and that is to never just kill your voters. You know, you don't want to actually kill them via incompetence because it's a very, very bad electoral strategy. And so what we're really seeing is, you know, a, about a five point embedded advantage for Biden that was due to Trump fatigue, Trump anger and fear, negative partisanship, which is what my model talks about, that was always going to give Democrats a, a structural advantage. I mean, that they just, they could have used in 2016 if they had been motivated, but they were complacent and they didn't exercise their demographic advantage. Um, and that turned it into basically a double sized advantage with the persuasion of more independence away from Trump with this pandemic mismanagement, which has just been a horribly mismanaged nightmare. And, you know, this last month in particular has really illustrated how poorly managed it's been because the because these red states that reopened uh, preemptively without managing the pandemic have the chickens have come home to roost. And this is just going to be a very bad situation for Trump headed all through the fall. One thing that I've really marveled at um, is the inability of the Trump campaign to define Biden, to define their opponent. You know, one of President Trump's unique abilities um, up until this point is to find an opponent's weakness um, and, and really take advantage of it, uh, find their strength yeah. and turn it into yeah. a weakness. Um, and 
he just, he and his campaign, I mean, his campaign has spent millions of dollars on television ads and Facebook ads, trying a bunch of different messages against Biden. And thus far, it just hasn't stuck, um, which is kind of surprising. Um, you know, incumbents usually have a head start to try to define their opponent. He, yep. and, and the Trump campaign has had an incredible cash advantage. They built a Death Star, um, yep. but um, they, they haven't really been able to, and, and they even at one point said they were training it on Biden. They were gonna, you know, the planet destroyer was coming in and yet it didn't, it, it really like Biden, so far has had an element of Teflon. Yeah, and Tamara, that's an excellent point. And really, I think what's killing them is that, you know, in 2016, it was about burning down the world and revolution, right? And now people just want to watch Monday Night Football in peace and not die, right? I mean, the, like the, the bar is much, much lower. <laughs> and then, you know, so when you think about the nicknames he's debuted against Biden, it's sleepy Joe. People are like, oh, I haven't been able to sleep in a year. You know, God, but yeah. I would love to be able to sleep. You know? <laughs> like, all of them sound great, you know? So like people look at Joe Biden and he's like, he's boring and that's comfortable. That's comforting. Like they're, he's calm and they're like, God, that would be nice, you know? So it's really, I think, really flummoxing Trump because the chaos president after four years and to close out those other four years were pretty bad in terms of like the, the chaos, but this fourth year, I mean, really is delivering in terms of chaos. And I think people are looking at Biden and just seeing this calm ship, right? And, then, yeah. and, and that actually would to me normally almost always be a liability except for in this one case, right? Well, when you see 138,000 people, Americans right. dying, yes, uh, you know, right. it does make you, <laughs> Uh, yeah. worry about the, the leadership in our country. And you've got, you've well, got a guy who literally can't even fake empathy. I mean, like, you know, I mean, it, it'd be, Trump has has spent almost zero, like, um, uh, bully pulpit effort on empathy. And you would think, like, they somebody had by now would have been like, okay, look, even if you don't feel it, buddy, you've got to get out there and do it, some empathy theater, right? No. Nothing. He, he, um, he, um, I, you know, talking to people who are around him, he, uh, is self-aware enough to know that he, um, like he, he wouldn't feel authentic doing it. And when he doesn't feel authentic doing something, he can't really perform. He can't do the show. Um, yeah. um well, that, that great, uh, American political theorist Groucho Marx once said, <laughs> The most important quality in politics is sincerity. And when you can fake that, you got it made. Yeah, yeah. And, it's true. You know, uh, and <laughs> this is very, yeah, this is, uh, because he, he has great difficulty. When he, when he said he didn't like people who've been captured, that was kind of the first yeah. of what you, what you would see that he's not a faker when it comes to his view. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, um, it's a you very know, the other thing unfortunate you know, aspect of his personality for this particular thing. moment. Yeah. yeah the other, the other thing about 2016 is that like the Trump show, he was putting on the Trump show and it was like relatively entertaining. Like remember when he, he got Lindsey Graham's phone number and gave it out on live right. TV. Like you never knew what he was going to do. And it was like super like funny. And it, you know, he was putting on his sort of like Catskills comedy show at every rally. Um, People aren't really looking for funny right no, now. People just don't want to die. Like that's yeah, it. Yeah, it's it's just <laughs> you know? it is just a vastly different environment. Yeah, yeah. Hey Rachel, I think that that's a pretty good truism of all of us. So. No doubt. And you know, I my my focus group of two are my personal <laughs> two uh, seniors who are you know they voted for Trump and they've hung with the guy you know pretty through and. Yeah, you know, this was this was you know this was the thing. They were like, you know, we really feel like we've got a lot. We don't want to die yet, like because the uh, you know the message they kind of were getting was, you know, you've lived a long life, get out there, and we got this economy. We've got to keep moving, you know. And they they didn't really like that message too much. So. No. <laughs> so let me, uh, if I might, move just quickly over to the Congress side of the picture. So uh, you know. I, I was raised in the article, I called it the Article One institution, although yeah. I don't think the founding uh, 
founders of our country kind of anticipated the evolution of one and two, yeah. and it's gotten very confused, certainly. But <laughs> what, uh, any any thoughts about um, about that? Not necessarily to prognosticate the uh, the elections, but to look at all these competitive Senate seats that are out there now, yeah. and uh, how the money is just rushing in on the Democratic side into a lot of these seats that were not heretofore competitive. I wonder if you might comment on this as it relates to November and the role of Trump in that effect. Yeah, it? yeah. And, you know, of course, I just have to precipice and say under the Bidikoffer model, all of these Senate seats were competitive pretty early and before the pandemic made them more so. Um, but yes, now they are super competitive. And, um, you know, once something, here's, here's, the, um, here's what we know from political science research. Once there is a national tide, uh, first off, I mean that. It, once the tide is against a party, that's a that's a it's tough because it it sets people up where they can recruit a party can recruit better challengers, and that's what you've seen. You see just fantastic uh, challengers with Mark Kelly in Arizona and Sarah Gideon in Maine and Teresa Greenfield in Iowa and um, Cal Cunningham. I mean just. So they're coming in with these great challengers. And the reason is these challengers felt, um, you know, people are risk adverse. And then when they feel like they have good chances, where they're more likely to emerge. And then the donors feel that and they start to, it starts to basically snowball. And we saw that with that first funding, uh, you know, report with, with all nominees basically chosen, almost all of them. And you can really sense that in that left side of the spectrum, there, there's a sense of, uh, we, they smell blood in the water to take that majority. And, um, and then of course you throw in the Lincoln project, right? <laughs> and that Lincoln project, I mean, you had to think about what's going on there. And of course I should disclose, I am on the board of the Lincoln project as an advisor. That does not mean I'm a principal, I'm an advisor. So, um, but in the Lincoln project, you have the top tier talent of Republican campaign strategist, um, people who ran, you know, five presidential campaigns for Republicans for 50 years, okay? The literally creme de la creme of the Republican campaign brain trust working now against Donald Trump and working to unseat these Senate Republicans. And, you know, they're working unmoored from any party or any other, you know, consideration. And they, you know, I think that is a real problem for these incumbents because who knows better how to beat them than their own people, right? They know exactly where all the weaknesses are there. And Republicans, if anyone who follows me knows that Republicans are just very good at electioneering, much, much better at electioneering than Democrats are. And, you know, um, you know I think the Lincoln Project in these Senate races is a major, major asset for Democrats. Tamara? Yeah, I would, I would just add that um, that money racing to these Democratic Senate, Senate candidates is an indication of energy. Mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of energy on the Democratic side. Now, a lot of it is negative energy, like <laughs> anti-Trump off the yeah. charts. Oh, yes. Negative energy that has motivated people, uh, motivated them to donate money to Senate campaigns in states that are nowhere near their state. Oh, yes. Um, and, and obviously the Supreme Court is something that, um, you know, we're, is typically something that motivates Republicans and, and evangelical voters. But um, given, uh, you know, the, the age of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the icon status that she has taken on, uh, it appears to be a motivator for Democrats as well. So Agree. I gotta, yeah. Can I just add? Sure, go ahead. Democrats feel so burned on what McConnell did with the um, Merrick Garland vacancy that they're convinced that not only do they need this presidency, but in order to fill the, any vacancy with a non-conservative justice, they have to flip the Senate. And so, you know, it, it really has, I think, kind of come back to bite Mitch on the butt because he is, um, you know, facing a fervor to take that Senate majority back that I don't know that he would quite have that much energy. And also as, as Tamara is pointing out, you know, for decades, it's been only on one side focus on the courts. And, and we now are going to see Democrats, I think, changing that. Um, you're going to start to see advertising that's court focused, at least on the um, digital sphere. 
uh, amongst like micro targeting into progressive or you know people who are coded in the voter file as as Democrats. And I think you're going to start to see over this next decade Democratic voters starting to in indicate importance of the courts. So well, one last question before we get to the audience, and that has to do with the media. And of course, uh, uh, <clears throat> Tamara, you're I guess part of the media. You're not the media, but you're. A, important part of the media. NPR is a very well-respected part of the media. Yeah, it's one of the best parts. Yeah. And, it's, it's, it's <laughs> and I love the media, so. <laughs> okay. So, but I noticed that uh, one of the, the chains of newspapers that they had the Sacramento Bee and the Kansas City Star and the Miami Herald, McClatchy has been bought by a um, uh, hedge fund or a yeah. process. And we're seeing, except for the New York Times and the Washington Post and Wall Street Journal and maybe USA Today, almost every newspaper in America is, is going down the toilet almost in terms of not being able to uh, financially keep itself up. And um, again, when I was in the political game, the Wichita Eagle, not one of the big newspapers, had the highest penetration rate of almost any paper in the United States. So that, that was a great stabilizer in our politics in terms of keeping us focused. And, and I, I just wonder if you might quickly comment on the role of the media in terms of uh, the preservation of our democratic elections uh, as you look down the road to November. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the sort of decline of the local paper, the corporatization of some local television, um, it's, it's a real concern um, because um, you know, there's no longer a shared set of facts. Um, and, and when there isn't a local paper, and in a lot of places there isn't a local paper, um, that's light that isn't being shined on the dark crevices of our government and others who should be held accountable. Um, and, and you talk about McClatchy, um, basically every news organization in America is in a big hole right now, almost every one of us, um, because of the pandemic affecting um, revenue. Um, you know, uh, people aren't listening to the radio as much. Uh, people, um, you know, there's advertisers don't want to be adjacent to, and I'm not talking about NPR here, but more broadly, advertisers don't want to be adjacent to death um, and sadness. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of advertisers that uh, would traditionally be advertising aren't uh, because they also don't have the money and they also are suffering. And so, uh, I mean, we are in a very uh, I, I, hopefully temporary but deep recession that is taking a toll on the news industry at a time when um, when the industry is in a really rough spot already. Um, we recently learned that Westwood One is going to be um, ceasing its radio operation, radio news operations. Um, you know, when the dust settles on, and everybody's doing layoffs or furloughs or pay cuts, when the dust settles on this, uh, the media landscape is going to be even um, less populated than it was before. Okay. I think we'll get to <laughs> Sorry. questions now. No, no, that's okay. uh, I just because it, it has a big impact in terms of what we're going to see. So Crystal, I'm yeah. going to turn it back over to you for Q&A. Great. We have a lot of great questions coming in. The first question is, we hear there are very few swing, whoops, hold on a sec. Uh, we hear that there are very few swing voters left to be persuaded and that negative partisanship will drive turnout. If someone who tells a pollster that they are still undecided, what is the likelihood that they will actually cast a vote? It's a really great question. And something that if I just had um, a big budget and my own survey capabilities, I would dig at. There's so much potential stuff like that that we just, we're not ever seeing survey surveyors tackle that I, I, I wish that we were looking at. Um, that said, you know, for many undecideds, they do end up casting a ballot. When I do run a survey, I mean, not this far out, but closer to election day, I usually push my undecideds um, with a prompt to kind of force them off the, the bench. Um, but, you know, generally speaking, I think, you know, 
right now we're looking at surveys that don't apply a likely voter screen to. So we're really looking at registered voter surveys, not likely voter surveys. And then even if you do get a likely voter survey, we're not looking at a tight screen or a model applied to it. So, you know, kind of, I guess my, my, my point is kind of hang tight. Um, but there are some people I think that are, they enjoy the attention of being undecided. They kind of like to be wooed or, um, you know, they, they have that whole debate last year or last cycle where they had only undecided voters come to the debate. So it can kind of make you feel a little special, you know? So there are some incentives, I think, to stay on the, on the bench. Uh, but it would be a fascinating question. And I, I just, like I said, I just wish I had money and, and survey capabilities because I, I can do surveys. I just don't have the money. And the other thing that I don't know the answer to uh, is, you know, given what could be potential difficulty in voting in November, um, either uh, difficulty in getting an absentee ballot or uh, fear of in-person voting, um, you know, how good are the likely voter models even going to be given the level of uncertainty about uh, how easy it will be for people to vote in various states? Yeah, it is so uncertain. And then we're going to have a lot of variability variability because of the way these governors have managed things, right? So we yep. have states like Florida and Texas that are just woo. And then, you know, other states where the management has been decent. I mean, the whole country has been mismanaged and that sets the context. So there's truly no state that's going to have a clean, safe, and I think, fall in terms of the pandemic. But um, yeah, there is going to be a lot of variability. Mm -hmm. And this is the part where I make my pitch about how uh, be prepared for election week rather than election yes. night, because oh, it's going to take a while for these uh, vote by mail ballots. And we need to normalize that and the fact that vote by mail and absentee ballot is perfectly legal and safe. Uh, that's why all of the entire White House, uh, including the president himself, the RNC chairwoman, all vote by mail because they know it is a wonderful way to vote. So it's certainly something that you, people should feel confident in. And uh, we will get those votes counted and American um, elections are nice and secure. Mm -hmm. um, following on from that, uh, is there a Bidikoffer model that incorporates foreign interference, particularly manipulation of the actual vote? So, you know, there's not a way to model that. <laughs> it's something <laughs> that I certainly watch. Um, I, you know, I do know, I mean, we do know really, we only know because that that one woman that um, leaked that information and, and is serving time in jail for it, I think that some of the voting um, systems were, or the the state uh, files were actually looked at, uh, but we we're told by the government that n there were no no real penetrations, and and you know we have to believe that that's the case. So I um, you know our, one thing that's beautiful about our system that's also terrible is the decentralization of it. So it's it the states manage the elections, as you can see. Some states like California are running really great elections that have been maximized towards participation, and some states have really kind of like I would call primitive election systems that don't um, really focus on participation. Uh, but the nice thing is, is it really does can prevent like a, a massive infiltration like operation. That said, like our election security could have been upgraded and the Senate um, did not take action on that. It was unfortunate the Senate majority leader chose not to and, and we're just gonna have to keep watching. Uh, how much will suburban realignment matter in 2020? In which states will it matter most? Ooh, the suburbs. I'm obsessed with the suburbs, um, though uh, I uh, have not dug into the data yet. But certainly, um, you know, suburbs were an area where President Trump had some strength, uh, and suburbs are where. Uh, people have gotten grumpy. Uh, and if, if you look at the suburbs, you know, and, and, you know, look at suburban Richmond, Virginia, not even like just Northern Virginia, but suburban Richmond, suburban Atlanta. Um, if you look at the midterms, um, the, these, uh, you know, suburban Philadelphia and other parts of Pennsylvania, um, these, this, it was like the revenge of the suburbs. 
yeah, the suburbs are the heart of the bit of coffer model. And, you know, the underperformance of turnout in the suburbs in 2016 were a key, not um, the or the only factor in Clinton's loss, but a key factor. And so when we think about Pennsylvania, like we're going to see a massively different performance in Pittsburgh and, and Philadelphia and those suburbs in those states. But when we think about where we're going, um, we're going to be talking about the Atlanta suburbs and the Texas suburbs a lot after the election, especially because we're going to be looking at at least, you know, four, maybe six. I mean, potentially if the Democrats invested a lot of money and right now, I think with the level of investment that we're looking at, Biden just bought an ad in Texas. Um, uh, we're looking probably about, you know, somewhere between four and six house seats gained in the Texas suburbs. And those are going to be in Dallas. And, and Houston, but also um, a couple pickups in, in the, um, that tap into the Austin uh, city limits. So um, yeah, so we're really talking about, you know, the suburbs outside of blue states used to benefit Democrats and red states, they benefited Republicans. That's really what we're talking about now is that suburbs outside of, outside of red state cities are realigning to the Democrats now and they're doing so largely due to generational replacement because the millennials and Zoomers are not growing up to be Republicans like their parents did, which who ironically didn't grow up to be Democrats like their parents did. <laughs> so we're really seeing um, you know, a, 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 a mostly generational change, but it's also independence and some Republicans who are um, not happy with the party of Trump, uh, like my Lincoln, project friends. Our next question is, who do you think Biden will pick as his running mate? And is it important that that it be a woman of color? First of all, I want you to know I've told them no, that I, my, my the, 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 the age, the age different. I'm much too young for him. Okay. That's so, what I was going to say. Yeah, I, I, you I, stole I, my joke. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I think a lot of people have made it clear to the Biden camp that it's important that it be a woman of color. <laughs> not, not me <laughs> in a New York <laughs> Times op-ed or anything, you know? <laughs> so yes, I think it's, it should be a woman of color. And you know what, that op-ed ran on a Tuesday, like a couple days after the George Floyd murder, but only like at the very beginning of the protest. And by the end of the week of that week, I think it was like, you know, pretty apparent that it would be, it would be a really big mistake not to read into this moment that, you know, this is a moment and we should get on the, on the roller coaster, <laughs> get on the ride. Yeah. Well, and you know, the interesting <laughs> thing is that uh, white liberals care about this a lot. It's, it, yeah. it, this is not necessarily about winning over voters of color. This is about winning over white liberals who say that it is very important to them that, I mean, who, who wanted, uh, you know, the Democratic nominee to potentially be a person of color and who say it's very important to them uh, that um, the, that the, their, the, the VP or the, the presidential nominee um, are, be more reflective of the Democratic race more broadly. Um, it, I mean, and much as um, sort of the public opinion and, uh, and, and even some of the protests have been driven more by white people than in the past. Um, you know, woke white liberals are a big part of this story. I'm really glad Tamara mentioned that actually, um, because like one of the reasons that when the Floyd uh, protests broke out and even though there was some rioting and looting that accompanied them, I was so uh, pushing back very ferociously on the idea that they would benefit Trump um, that there would be a backlash effect. It was because of woke white liberals who for a long time now in public opinion data have been showing a immense uh, propensity towards white uh, or towards liberalization on racial attitudes. So it doesn't surprise me at all to hear that um, Tamara's seen data that shows that white liberals are very supportive or maybe even more supportive of the idea of a person of color running um, on the ticket. Um, but for me, I kind of think about it a little differently. I'm thinking about it in terms of a turnout booster. And I, I can't remember who I saw on Twitter, but it was um, definitely somebody of color. And they were talking about how their grandma would vote for Joe Biden. But if he had a female running mate of color, 
she would also drag all of their aunts and aunt and uh, aunts and cousins and all of her friends from church to do it too. And I think about like, for me, that's how I think about it. Great. Uh, the next question is, I'm from Arizona, which will be a state to watch in 2020. How do we get new voters, particularly minorities and millennials out to vote? Well, I mean, the, the first part is um, registering people to vote. And there had been a real lull in voter registration, especially because like, you know, farmers markets and places where people go to get people to register, colleges, things were closed. Yeah. Um, there has been sort of a resurgence in voter registration. Um, and, uh, you know, another part of that is voter education because, you um, First time voters uh, are more likely to have their mail-in ballots get thrown out for one reason or another. Mm -hmm. um, so um, there, you know, and it's not, yeah, I'm not in, I'm not, I'm not running campaigns, but um, voter education is certainly part of that in voter registration. I have two words for you, pie and punch. Otherwise known as the South Park strategy, you have to get young people excited to go out. So I argue, you know, kind of the ship has sailed on the candidate being exciting. I mean, you know, we were just talking about that actually being an asset in a ironic, weird way that Joe Biden is, is boring and comforting, like a nice fuzzy blanket at a fireplace. But the one downside is that he isn't particularly exciting for the under uh, 30 and especially the under 25 sect. Now, for um, some degree, though, it really won't matter. The Democrats weren't particularly exciting in terms of their candidates in 2018, with a couple of exceptions. And yet we saw in the districts that I analyzed in the voter file, youth turnout rates you know, of 1,000%, 2,000% in some of those districts um, for the 18 to 24-year-old group uh, over 2014. So I think youth turnout is going to go up over 2016, no matter what. Um, that said, you know, I do think that it would be helpful to get, you know, you know, someone like Kamala Harris does have some coolness about her, right? She knows how to use social media more effectively than Biden, who is like literally does not know how to use it at all. So anything that can get young people engaged in that way. But, um, you know, young people like coolness. I mean, that's why Obama, you know, the whole reason Obama pulled up young person turnout wasn't his policies, dude. It was his coolness. <laughs> and then he goes out wearing dad jeans. I, know. I don't know. But you know what? If Bernie Sanders can be cool, dad jeans can be cool, right? Just depend. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen, right? It shows you what the essence of politics is all about. No doubt. No doubt. <laughs> Our next question is, how much will gerrymandering affect the Electoral College and the election outcome? Rachel, you want to go? <laughs> I mean, I mean ger I, you know, gerrymander is just an institutional constraint that's been there. I mean, it was there in 2018. People were saying crazy things like, oh, they have to win by 10 points to win the House. I was like, dude, no, you know, but... <laughs> I mean, it's there, you know, so uh, it's going to be, it affects things. It certainly affects, you know, it's, it's a, more impactful in, in some places than others, like uh, Ohio and North Carolina and Texas, where the gerrymanders are more profound. I mean, I think the more impactful thing to talk about for gerrymandering is that it's the 2020 cycle, reapportionment and redistricting are going to occur off of this cycle. So if I would, and, and given the salience that um, gerrymandering has obtained on the left, which in, in our Virginia polling, when I was at the Lawson, Lawson Center, you know, very few things surprise me in public opinion data. So when something does surprise me, I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And my um, colleague had started pulling redistricting questions lo long before I came on board, then he had pulled it all the way through. And by the time I was, I, you know, got into it, it 50 something percent, 60 percent of people in Virginia were knew what redistricting was about. They understood the issue in a pretty sophisticated way. I mean, that's that's really big. OK, so it tells me like Democrats are underutilizing the um, salience of this is the year people like the next 10 years are going to be determined off of these state legislative and gubernatorial elections. And I've barely heard a peep about it. So, um, you know, I think really that's where gerrymandering conversation is probably most important. 
Our next question is, what are your thoughts regarding the Hispanic vote and how much will that come into play in this election? Um, you know, uh, it, uh, it was really interesting in the primary. Of course, the primary is now behind us and it didn't last very long. But, um, you know, Bernie Sanders was able to really do something uh, with the Hispanic vote, in particular in Nevada. Um, he, he put a real emphasis on it. It was organic to his campaign. T.O. Bernie um, was, was sort of this calling card. And, um, and, and it proved wildly successful for him in the state of Nevada. Um, but, you know, then the primary moved to South Carolina, where the Latino vote isn't as important. Um, so, uh, you know, obviously it, there are three states uh, that are battleground states where the Latino vote is very important uh, for, sorry, uh, Nevada, Arizona, Texas, I guess we're going to call it a potential swing state, uh, and Florida. Um, now, there's uh, a lot of diversity uh, within the Latino vote. The Latino vote is by no means a monolith, and depending on which state you're in, uh, particularly in Texas, um, uh, a larger share of Latino voters are conservative. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in a state like Nevada and in a state like Arizona, it is absolutely important. And, um, and the Trump campaign knows that, uh, and the fact that they're talking about it and, uh, you know, trying to convince reporters like me that they are going to win the Latino, you know, win a larger share of Latino voters than you expect in a state like Arizona uh, means that um, they also expect it to matter to the outcome. Yeah, funny you should mention Latino voters because the very next episode of the Election Whisperer, Shameless Plug, is going to have a whole special on Latino voters and it's bringing in Chuck uh, uh, Rocha, who was the uh, political director for Bernie's Latino outreach effort in Nevada because what he did was so extraordinary. And actually what it was that made it so extraordinary was that he did something, right? Like the Democrats usually don't actually spend a lot of effort and time organizing Latino voters, which seems a little crazy given how important that voting block would be to their efforts to win Texas and Arizona and Florida and you know Nevada, of course, which they tend to do better in. Uh, so we'll have um, him on the show as well as, well as uh, Stephanie Valencia, who does uh, Latino public opinion. And uh, but we do know Biden at least understands that you know this is an important part of the um, effort to win Arizona and Florida because he hired um, Latino decisions that was announced yesterday, which is a very good public opinion, um, you know, firm for the Latino polling. And uh, that was just announced yesterday. So, um, but yeah, I uh, think literally if the Democrats put in the kind of effort Bernie Sanders did in that Nevada primary on Latino turnout, it's not, I mean, it's, the, it's not like you're inventing the wheel. All you're doing is, uh, you know, it's a simple thing. The mechanics are there and you just have to implement it. There's no doubt in my mind they could flip Texas this cycle, but it's a matter of, do they get that? Do they get the money and they do it? Yeah, that's where the ifs start to come in. So um, with one minute left, we have a really long last question, but it's a really good one. Um, you talk about how deeply entrenched each party is in its own belief system. Do you think that's how it will always be uh, regardless of who the president is and which party they're from? Um, if so, what do you think the impact will be on society? Uh, will people go further into their corners? Um, what will it take to bring our nation closer to the middle, at least civilly and politically? How about it, Tamara, first go? <laughs> um, that's a good question. I, I do think that over time, our society corrects. Um, it doesn't always correct, but, um, you know, if you, if you look at after Watergate, you ended up with uh, Congress uh, passing a bunch of bills to sort of uh, restore norms or put norms into law. Um, and and I, I do wonder if um, the potential exists for, uh, you know, a backlash against partisanship. I mean, certainly what you've seen is that uh, and, and particularly at this time on the Republican side, though it could sort of happen on the on the left if, if there was the, the right 
president or the right leadership to cause frustration. But um, there, there have been people who, who don't feel like they belong in the Republican Party anymore, uh, people who feel like they're kind of on an island. Um, and I mean, it's certainly not enough for there to be a real third party or a, you know, a middle way. Um, that's not happening. But there is some, at least um, on the margins, realigning of, of partisan identity. I mean, the Lincoln Project is very, very clear about their goals. Their goal is not to get through this election cycle, disrupt Trump, and then get back to running Republican campaigns. Their goal is to destroy the current version of the Republican Party, which is a distinctly different party. All right, we are not talking about, we have had a, a party that has had a, a rebellion, a revolution, a civil war that was waged a losing faction, the mainstream part of the party lost, and those who did not go along to get along with the, re, with the uh, reconstruction got kicked out or had to leave, right? And we're talking about exiles now or waging this war, right? So, um, you know, we don't talk about that, but that's, that's the case. I mean, we're not talking about Donald Trump as the leader of a different Republican party you know, supporting and advancing issues that are way far away from traditional Republic, Russia, like that stuff, that, I mean, think about traditional Republicanism. So, you know, it's a story that is, we're not, we're on like chapter 12 and it's getting written. And you, if you're listening to this or involved in any way are in the story, even if it's a small part. So I would definitely consider, you know, urge you to consider that you're part of the story in the way that you act or the things that you're doing and the checks that you're writing and the activities you take part in going forward. And Crystal, I would just add that to two issues we're not time to talk about today, national service, some form of national service, yes. to bring Americans together of all identity. Yes. And then somehow dealing with this issue of civic engagement, civic education, uh, so that uh, uh, we try to educate people a little more about what their country's about and the values of our country. Those and, would be two other things. And Dan, if you'll indulge me, like that's literally what my, my, my work is at the Niskanen Center is, it's not that, it's, a, it's identifying like the fix, like the, how do we fix, because the elite, a lot of the focus is on the elites, but we need to really fix it at the ground level. Mm -hmm. What a great way to, to end this event. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, it was such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you, Dan. Thanks to our audience for tuning in. Thanks for all the great questions. Uh, all of our community events this summer are free and open to the public. And so if you are in a position to donate, please click on the link in the chat. I hope you'll join us for the rest of our summer events. Tomorrow, we're feature, featuring Lori Santos in our Hearst Lecture Series. Thanks for joining us.